so, so today is, we're finishing up with utilitarianism. And um, last time we introduced this distinction between qualitative and quantitative utilitarianism. Mill was trying to improve on Bentham's philosophy, right? And the same thing is going to happen with the material that we're looking at today, at least most of it. And that has to do with what we call rule utilitarianism as opposed to act utilitarianism. And this is a distinction I think you guys can wrap your head around really easily. Um, there's some things that from a utilitarian perspective would be okay if you consider them in isolation, just as this kind of act. You know, so the game show example that we've, we've used a couple times, where we pick one of you, put you in, in uh, a game show where we do you know, terrible things to you, embarrassing, you know, things that you, you're going to have a hard time recovering from, not so much physically, but, but, but mentally, and we all enjoy it, right? So from a, from a utilitarian perspective, provided that the pleasure that we all get from watching you, you know, do whatever, eat beetles, you know, ride around in a bed full of worms, the sort of things they have in some of those, those shows, um, so long as we get more pleasure than, than your pain, it's okay. As a matter of fact, it's not only okay, we ought to do it. Um, from a utilitarian perspective. But if you think about it in terms of, let's say we made that a general practice or a rule in society, how would that pan out? Do you think that would lead to a, a better society overall, or would some of those things start to make you feel bad? Give you a sense that something is wrong? Uh, maybe even disgust you, or you know, make you angry, or things like that. If that's the case, then it would have sort of collateral damage, you might say. There would be some pain beyond just what's in the situation. Another good example of this, um, if you were to break the law, or take the law into your own hands, to rectify a situation in which somebody was doing bad things, bad things from a utilitarian perspective, say, you know, creating much more pain than other people. Let's say you're in a case where, you know, these things happen quite often. Somebody's out there and they're um, burning people's houses down, or, you know, committing rapes, or um, committing murders, or engaging in fraud, or any of these sort of things along these lines. And you know that it's going to take a very long time for the justice system to track them down. It's kind of a crapshoot whether they'll actually be prosecuted. Um, in the time that that'll take, more damage is going to be done to the society. Shouldn't you take the law into your own hands? I mean, if, if you're thinking about this from a utilitarian perspective, I think there's a good argument, at least if you're considering that sort of case. Sure. What you were going to yeah. follow yeah. up? Um, what if we made that a general practice, though? Would that have any bad consequences? What do you think? Yeah. I think it goes both ways. Yes, it's good that you got to stop the guy. Yeah. But then there's a reason why vigilantes are illegal because we have a court system where we can figure out whether it was really not that person who did it. If yeah. we keep harming people who <coughs> haven't done it, then I guess the whole population won't feel safe at that point. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you could look at um, historical studies and you could say what happens in societies where people start in general taking the law into their own hands and say forming militias or things like that. Well, look at Somalia. Look at some other what we call failed states. Those are sort of an extreme example. But, um, you know, it, it's worth thinking about this. The, the urban gangs that we have, many of them started out as protective associations neighborhood um, you know, building associations, and then they sort of morphed over time. There's a, there's a tendency for these sort of things to become corrosive, and that's what rural utilitarianism takes into account. So there's some things that from an act perspective would be okay, that from a rural perspective are, are not going to be okay. And that's mostly what we're going to talk about today, uh, when we get to you know, perfect and imperfect duties and justice. Before we do that, um, I want to do two things. One is, I want to bring up this quote here, because this is kind of a good one to sort of center everything around. And then we're going to talk about um, motivation and how we make moral decisions, um, and what Mill has to say about that. So this is something Martin Luther King said, 
And I don't have, it, have all of you seen this quote before in one form or another? This is a great quote for what we're looking at today. It says, it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me. So there's, there's some things that the law can or ought to be able to do. Keeping people from lynching other people, the law ought to, you know, if, if the law is worth anything, it ought to prevent that. Um, murders in general, it ought to prevent that, right? Threatening violence, using violence against other people more broadly, the law ought to prevent that. Um, and we'll look at the why in a moment. <clears throat> the law can't make a person love another person. As a lawyer recently said to me as we were talking about this sort of thing, you cannot legislate personality. Um, a judge cannot say to somebody, you have to, you have to love this other person. You have to even like this other person. <clears throat> I mean, not only can, not, can judges not do that, can your teachers make you like other people? They might persuade you to, but they can't make you. If I divide you into groups and I say, okay, now you've got to really get to know and like all the people in your group. You don't have to do that. As a matter of fact, do you feel a little, do you feel that's a little weird to try to make you like other people, to insist that you, you love them or be kind to them or things like that? Um, but you know, don't kill each other. I can tell you that. The law can tell you that. You can tell me that. We have rights involved there, rights and duties. Um, so this is, keep this in mind as, as we're going through this, this distinction between these two different kinds of, of uh, good acts. Because it's good not to lynch people. It's bad to lynch people. It's good to love people too, isn't it? It's better to love people than to not love people, isn't it? From a utilitarian perspective. To behave in a loving manner, to, to feel the sense of attachment. Those are good things. But there's some things that can be matters of justice and others which are, are, are not matters of justice. So that said, now let's think about what he talks about in terms of uh, human motivation. And I'm going to use this quote. In your experience, when you have had in, in the past to decide cases of <coughs> right and wrong, And it could have been cases where there were, say, two different right things. It seemed like there were two right things to do in the situation, but they weren't equally compatible. Um, like, you know, the, the example that Sark had of should his, this young man go off and join the resistance and fight the, the Nazi occupation, that would be a right thing to do. Wouldn't it? To serve, you know, not only one's country, but to get the occupiers out. But he also ought to stay home and take care of his aged mother, who would worry an awful lot if she knew that her son were out there facing danger. There are two right things to do, and it's sometimes difficult to decide between these. Um, other cases are where there's somebody who's going to get hurt no matter what. There's, it's very difficult to find the right thing in, in the sense that you know it satisfies every requirement, and we have to choose sometimes between two or three evils. We have to figure out which is the lesser of the two evils, you guys are familiar with cases like that. Two of your friends uh, get into an irreconcilable conflict with each other and become enemies. You don't have a third option of um, you know, making them get back together. Do you A, choose this friend, B, choose this friend, C, try to play you know, half and half, um, D, extricate yourself from the situation altogether? None of those are really going to be good, are they? But you could talk about right and wrong when it comes to those. Um, and then sometimes there's situations where you know what the right thing to do and you know what the wrong thing to do is, but unfortunately you're more tempted by the wrong thing than you are motivated by the right. And it's a question of whether you're going to resist that temptation or, or you know, follow it. You guys are all familiar with these kind of situations. Um, I think you probably face a situation like that every time that you have to decide to do homework, don't you? Um, or, you know, certain readings or things like that. Or to go visit somebody who you really ought to visit, but you'd much rather stay home. Yeah, these are common things. 
How do you normally decide these things? Do you go through a process in your mind? You may do this for some things, where you draw kind of a T-chart, you know, pros and cons, and you list them on each side. Maybe you don't draw it, maybe you tally it up in your mind, or you talk it over with somebody. How many of you ever do that? How many of you would say that you do that most of the time? Very few people, right? Um, do any of you ever go through, now that you've, you know, we went through Bentham and utilitarian calculation, have any of you started making that part of your, your way of approaching moral problems? And, you know, not only do you draw like a T-chart, you actually give numbers to these things, and then you've done that for, for each person, and you, you put all the numbers together and figure it out that way. Does anybody ever do that? I've never done that in my life. We do things kind of like Right? We would make arguments with each other and we say, well, look, this is going to benefit most of the group. Um, and it could be things as trivial as you get a bunch of people together and you want to get a pizza. Okay, who wants what on the pizza? There's always somebody who doesn't like sausage, doesn't like pepperoni. What do you tell them? Eh, you can pick it off or mushrooms or peppers. Because the rest of us like this and we're going to go with what the group as a whole is going to be happier with. The, the, you know, the greatest happiness principle. <coughs> Did you ever frame that in terms of, you know, well, Jeremy Bentham said, or John Stuart Mill said, we should always maximize utility. That is, we should always bring about the action that will uh, maximize pleasure, minimize pain for all those concerned. <laughs> Your friends would look at you like you're crazy, right? Um, or maybe they'd they look at you in awe. You know, wow, my college education is really giving me something. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, we don't often invoke this. If we were going to be if we were going to try to all be utilitarians, we should actually be using this, though. We should be making recourse to this. We should make that a habit of the way in which we decide things. How do we actually decide things, though? You guys have been through a lot of different moral, problematic situations. How have you decided things? Yeah. I feel like after a certain <coughs> age, you kind of develop a pattern in your decision making. OK, so patterns or habits. Mill uses a great term here. Association. <clears throat> um, what else? Do you ever, do you ever, yeah? Impulse. Impulse, yeah. Um, we have a lot of words for this too. Impulse. Um, sometimes they say just like feeling or intuition or relying on your guts, you know. You have a gut, gut feeling that tells you, you should, this is the right thing to do. You can't quite explain it to somebody, but you know it's the right thing to do. You know this is the wrong thing to do. You can't quite articulate why. Um, what else? Anything else that, that pops up sometimes? I'm willing to bet that for <coughs> most, if not all of you, some rules, not necessarily you know, systematically put together and thought out, but some rules will pop up from time to time. Um, or maybe even, you know, sayings. Yeah. Are like, would rules be considered like principles? Ah, that's where I'm heading towards. Um, they could be in some cases, and in other cases, they're just thrown together in this, this whole mishmash that Mill calls an association, what he calls customary morality. Um, and, and that's a good question. Think about the way in which you learn the rules that have probably been, to some degree, burned into your mind that have become part of your moral life. When you were a little kid, your parents rewarded you and punished you, and they praised you and they, they criticized you. Uh, if, it went, you know, if your parents didn't do that, um, there, there's something wrong. Um, but everybody else did it too. Your teachers did it. Um, your peers did it. Peers probably screwed up. <coughs> Odds are your parents and teachers probably screwed up a bit too. Um, 
your coaches did it, Every, everybody did it around you. We're constantly influencing each other morally. But we do so in very informal, less principled, more sort of on the fly ways. So you did something wrong. You hit your brother or your sister, and your parents punished you, and they said, <coughs> you don't hit people. And then you, you said something like, but I was mad at them, or they did this. And then they said, doesn't matter, you still don't hit people. <coughs> you were learning a, a rule. You weren't learning it in the sense of a general moral principle, where then you asked your parent, well, why don't we hit people? And they said, well, I'm glad you asked that question. You see, the greatest happiness principle, understood this way, would legislate against hitting people. They didn't say anything like that, right? They, what did they often say? Things like, because I said so. Or, that's just the way it is. Or, shut up. <laughs> Quit asking so many questions. Right? And that's the way most of us learn morality. That's the way I learned morality. And there were some things, too, where you yourself probably did some thinking about it. Um, you know, this isn't fair. That, you know, things should go this way. So that, that enters into it as well. Your own reflections, I think. But a lot of these rules or sayings, you know, think about when you, when you sassed your mom or dad, uh, if they were in certain kind of households, they may have quoted the Bible to you, honor thy mother and thy father. You know, they said, where'd that come from? Ten Commandments, God wants you to do this. And, you know, then you said, well, what does honor really mean? Does that mean obey? I don't know. You, know, I mean, you probably got into some discussion about it at some point if that came up, but it probably wasn't one in terms of, of general moral principles. It was probably a lot of different things thrown in together. And another thing that comes up as well is, is um, models. It'd be like this person, don't be like this person. And, and we get some of those from our parents. Why can't you be more like your brother? You know, why can't your brother be more like you? Um, don't be like your screw-up uncle. Uh, look, at the, look at the mess he's made of his life. Those are offering you models. People get on TV, you know, um, who you think has got, got, it, go, you know, got their life together, you model yourself after them. Hopefully those that, that have got their life pretty well screwed up, you don't model yourself after them. You say, wow, those people are really screwed up on Jerry Springer. Thank God I'm not like them. I don't want to be one of them. Now, all this gets kind of thrown together. And by the time that you're your age, you've lived through a ton of this stuff, and you have, in fact, formed patterns or habits or, or associations. And those um, feel like the way things ought to be. You may, you know, change it, reconsider it over time. You may, you may look at yourself at certain points. I know I did myself, and say, wow, I'm a jerk. I need to quit acting this way. People don't like this. I'm, I'm you know, hurting people that I like, or alienating people, or this is not working for me, or I don't even like this myself. You know, That may have happened from time to time, but for the most part, we're kind of you know, sailing along and reacting to situations. And we're not you know, relying on some sort of general principle. We're relying on feeling. We come up with some you know, explanations. Um, but oftentimes they're just kind of thrown together on the fly. And your parents did this, and their grandparents did this, unless your parents were like, you know, moral philosophers or something, or theologians, which is pretty, you know, doubtful. I mean, my dad was, was a tax attorney. He didn't even do stuff like that. He would just say, it's just the way it is, or that common sense says so, or that's the way the world works, you know, get with it. Um, so you're going to feel that this, makes a lot more sense, intuitively, than this. Um, and it'll, that will go for any system of ethics. If up to this point, when you were reading Plato and about virtue ethics, you said, yeah, I don't know about this. Um, I don't really feel this call of justice, you know, these virtues. Well, that's because it's moral theory, and you're not used to thinking in terms in the rest of your practical life of moral theory. It can help you out a lot, but you have to actually like choose to make it part of, part of your patterns, part of your new associations. And so what Mill is saying is, if utilitarianism was actually going to work as a way of structuring things, 
what you would have to do is change the way people are educated about moral matters. You would have to take utilitarianism and start teaching it way earlier. Not just in sort of a, a naive way, you know, okay, little Johnny, little Susie, you're, you're faced with this problem of how to divide up the cake. Should you divide it up, you know, evenly or give your friends bigger pieces? Well, how is everybody as a whole going to feel if you, if you play favorites? That's sort of doing utilitarianism, you know, for kids in the classroom with a very practical application that would fit the greatest happiness principle, but you're not actually working it out that way, are you? You're not getting them to see that that's the, the, the main principle and they should always use that. Um, or ordering pizza, or what card game to play, or what movie to watch, or things like that. But you could do that, couldn't you? We could, in fact, have, um, you know, we could have people as attached to this as they are to this. Um, I think you've, you've got some books that kind of kind of fit that. Maybe some movies. Maybe if some of you can think of movies that fit that, that would be useful. Have any of you, like when you're in high school or middle school, had to read Walden Two or Brave New World? Um, I forget who Walden Two is by, but Brave New World is by Huxley. Those would be utilitarian books where they're actually trying to carry out an education which gets people to associate their pleasure, their desires with the pleasures of the whole community. So I think you could see some things like that. They don't, they don't necessarily have to be of that sort. You could, you could have um, non-utopian books where, where that was the case, but I can't think of any offhand. Um, so this is what we call the customary morality. Are there any of the things that, that do motivate that we need to look at as challenges to the greatest happiness principle. Um, yeah, there are some people who get beyond just customary morality. And there are other moral theories out there, right? We looked at <coughs> virtue ethics. So virtue could be kind of a challenge. Um, I don't expect you to automatically come up with the next one because we're going to start looking at it next week. Duty. <clears throat> Duty can be a big thing. Um, what does the utilitarian think is the ultimate good? Virtue ethics thinks virtue is the ultimate good, or at least closely tied to it. Uh, deontology thinks that doing your duty is, is what's most good. What do utilitarians think is most good? Yeah. We'll bring some old Tully community. So mm -hmm. I don't know how to put that in one word. Um, what is utility ultimately? How uh, useful. Some, somebody said. Pleasure. Pleasure. Pleasure, oh, right. Pleasure and lack of pain. Because utilitarianism is a is a hedonism, right? <coughs> and utilitarianism says that this ought to be the end. And everything else should be, should be a means. Everything else is good insofar as it ultimately leads to pleasure and pain. And who is pleasure and pain? The majority or, or the, 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 you know, the balance of people overall. But now if we're talking about the individual, um, how do you motivate the individual? Because some individuals seem to be more motivated by duty than pleasure or pain. <clears throat> They'll actually sacrifice some pleasure and undergo some pain themselves to do their duty. As a matter of fact, they'll say, hey, uh, I don't care what the, what the consequences are. I didn't do the right thing. So even if it had good consequences, I still feel bad. Or they'll say, hey, I still feel good even though things turned out badly because uh, I chose the right thing. That's the right thing to do. You always ought to do the right thing no matter what the, the consequences are. Um, other people are motivated by wanting to be a certain kind of person, having certain character traits, you know, being this sort of person. And it might be, it might be identified with, with social roles, like, say, being a good cop. Uh, that might not just be a matter of having certain duties and doing them, yeah. Do you think it's possible, I mean, do you think it's possible to be able to feel that way, to feel that 
truly, like, I know I did the right thing, but it suffered bad consequences. Do you think it's possible to feel that way without having like, doubt? Oh. Because it's a lot easier to, to be a, okay with doing something bad that has good results. In my personal opinion, yeah. than doing something good that has bad results without having any doubt. That's a, that's a very interesting question. That, that's a big question, so I can't give like a full answer to it. I, I can say that historically, we, we have people who, at least from what we can tell, did what they saw as being the right thing, even though it put them and oftentimes people that they cared about at great risk or even you know, just doomed them. Um, martyrs to different causes, for example. I mean, you look at some of the early Christian martyrs and, and uh, the stories, and these might be a little bit inflated. Um, we call that hagiographical. Uh, but they, they probably reflect something, which is that these people were really committed to certain values, and they were willing to die for those values no matter what. And while they were being killed for those values, they were doing things like, like sticking to what they saw as virtue, like, like being loving and saying, yeah, forgive this, this person who's torturing me. That would be really tough to do. I know I could do that. But, well, maybe I could in a, a different me could do that. <laughs> the me that I ought to be. Um, so yeah, I think there, there's cases where one could have absolute certainty and be accurate with that. But it's not often the norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the main thing, especially people like we're discussing absolute good. Yeah. Uh, the pain of not following your values. Ah. Is bigger yes. than the pain you would have received by following. Yeah, and you're getting to where, where Mill is going to make his argument. So this is this is an, an end that's acknowledged for just about everybody, but there could be other ends. Mill says, well, they're not really other ends. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at why somebody, well, let's take another one before that. We'll take wealth. If I give you a $5 bill, which actually, you know, I was going to get a one, but one's not worth very much, right? This is you can actually do a little bit with, like go to Starbucks and get yourself a, a latte. Uh, provided you don't get too many bells and whistles on it, because there's tags. Um, or, you know, get, get a grande instead of a Benzo. If I give this to you in a card, like, uh, you guys have student mailboxes, right? So I send this to you in a card. You get this. You feel good. And that good feeling that comes with this, because this has no, I mean, it's, it's not even like particularly aesthetically attractive money. Other people's money tends to look a lot better than ours. Uh, except that ours feels better to us because we can actually use it to buy things that we like. And you have put together over the course of your lifetime, you've had lots of experience in handing this to somebody getting something in return that you like, right? Having so many of these in the wallet and knowing that you can go and get some things that you, you would like to get. Going to the, the, to the cash machine and seeing these come rolling out. You have sort of you know good associations with that. And why? Well, because you desire this app. But do some people become so fixated on the money itself that they almost seem to lose sight of the pleasures it can provide them? Yeah. The people who scrimp and save and deny themselves all sorts of pleasures, why do they do that? Well, because they get a greater pleasure out of having the money than out of the rest of us, I assume, spending the money. Right? Um, but it's still pleasure and pain. And that pleasure came about through a process of association. Uh, the same thing can work for <coughs> duties. When you're a kid, you do your duties, and if you do your duties, whatever they're perceived to be, you in general get pleasures, or you're, you're at least not getting pains. You know, maybe maybe your parents <coughs> are more the either punish you or not punish you, not reward you, sort of sort, or maybe they were of the opposite. You know. We're going to reward you a lot, or reward you less, or not reward you at all. You know, or it could go with praise and criticism as well. But why did you start doing duties in the first place? 
Did you do them because you thought they were great in and of themselves? Probably not. You did them because they led to good outcomes. Like your chores. How many of you had chores when you were kids? Okay. Why did you do those chores? Because you had to. And what would happen if you didn't? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what your punishments were like when we were kids, but we arranged the whole gamut. We had something that went beyond time out called the punishment stool. And that was worse than spankings. I would rather take a spanking than a punishment stool. Because you had to sit on this hard stool and face the wall for 15 minutes, which sounds pretty easy, right? Except that if you asked how long you were into it, the 15 minutes started again. And when you're, you know, like 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15 minutes seems like an eternity, doesn't it? Wow, I've never heard of this. I like it. It works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could end up being in that stool for two hours. Because it was so hard to resist the temptation to ask, is, is it over yet? You know? um, well, that made an impression on me. <laughs> you, know? you probably had things that made impressions on you that way, too, right? I'm willing to bet all of you did. Uh, and that's, you know, that's pain. Um, what kind of what kind of pleasures did you get when you did your duties? What's that? <laughs> Cookies? Yeah, those are those are good pleasures. You got a chance to do stuff you like rather than spending time being punished. Oh, it opened up opportunities for other things. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's that's true. We're getting to the idea of utility right now. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, or or maybe uh, you got to go to a, a show or right. um, playtime. You got to go over to your friend's house. We, we could like go through all these. Another one that was really important, praise. If your parents praised you for doing the right thing, you know, if they saw you being fair with other kids or your teachers or whoever, and they said, that's a really good thing for you to do. You're a good kid. You felt that and you liked that. that you know, unless there was something wrong with you and you didn't like being called a good kid, which I doubt is, is the case, and eventually, you came to associate duty itself with the pleasure and pain. The duty was originally just a, a means to an end. But eventually you forget that. And the duty starts to take on a life of its own. And you feel a kind of pleasure in doing your duty. And you feel a kind of pain when you don't do your duty. Right? And it starts to look like this is the motivating end for you. But really what's still going on is it's still all about pleasure and pain. But now there's, there's a pleasure and pain that's come with the, the duty itself. And that's the reason why you feel that way in your heart, in the fabric of your, your person about duties, about right and wrong. So if you discover that you have a new duty, you transfer that feeling over to that. It's not just, you know, you have a set of chores. Now you're students, right? You have, you have different duties now. When you get um, out of school, I imagine a lot of you eventually are going to be married, or at least you know, have long-term committed relationships. Um, you're going to have duties that come with that that are going to be a bit, be a bit different, you know, new duties. Um, you have a whole, you know, whole bunch of just a few kids. Other duties are going to come with that. The jobs that you're preparing for, that's going to come with that. And some of you, Mill would say, are so motivated by this sense of duty now that when you do it, you feel, you feel good. And the more that you do that, the more you're going to feel good. And if you're motivated by duty and you fail to do it, you feel bad. And each time that you feel that feeling and you tell yourself that's the way it ought to be, you're reinforcing that. Same thing for virtues, for character traits, for thinking about the kind of person you, you want to be, for modeling yourself after a certain pattern of uh, when you were a kid, you were rewarded, punished, praised, blamed for, and you got pleasure and pain, for exhibiting certain character traits. If you were greedy, did your parents call you on that? Don't be so greedy. You, you probably you know, realized don't be greedy too because other kids didn't like it when you were greedy and you took more than your fair share. And you probably also realized that that wasn't a good character trait when you didn't like it when the other kid did too, right? Um, if you're nice to people, people treat you nicer. If you're mean to people, they don't like you. Um, there's certain character traits. 
So, you know, justice, courage, if you stand up for what you believe in at the right time, to the right degree, not like crazy and beating people up over it all, all the time, but, you know, actually like standing up in the face of, of adversity, do people respect that? In general, they do. Do they respect cowards? Not much. Um, <clears throat> what virtues you have or what virtues you aspire to, what virtues you see as good things, as good character traits, is a matter for, for Mill of pain and pleasure, deep down inside. And you only think that this is a necessary end for you because you've forgotten this whole process where it was just a means and now it's taken on the role of an end. But why is it an end? Because it brings you pleasure to have or to exhibit or to think of yourself having these, these characteristics. And it brings you pain to think that you don't have them. So, you know, feeling, feeling that you would like to do the wrong thing because you um, are not yet entirely honest or just or courageous, that makes you feel bad, doesn't it? Why does it make you feel bad? Well, because of, Mill says this whole process of association. Um, so this is a nice way to try to sweep everything all into utilitarianism. Uh, I, I don't know. You, you can think about whether you buy it or not. I, I see some some problems with this, but I think this is something that you should you should mull over a bit. We're, these are some of the key things we're going to look at through the rest of the semester. Duty, virtue, pleasure. Are these, you know, which of these should predominate? Which of these should be the motivating principle that we arrange our ethics around? Yeah. So basically, no kind of like puts us down to like the most basic form of an animal kind of deal because it's like. Oh. If you think about it, like you were talking about the monkeys, I think that yeah. you mentioned. Like, Could we make monkeys virtuous? <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if I portray this characteristic, look, all the other monkeys like me. Yeah. If I if I do this, all the other monkeys like me. If I follow this duty, even though I don't like it right now, it's going to bring me pleasure later on. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, well, like the same thing, like the monkey that didn't go to grab the banana. Yeah. Because duty required him not to, otherwise all the monkeys would turn on him because the other monkeys would be hurt, kind of deal. Maybe. I mean, I, it's something to I don't, think about. You know, I don't think they think of it to that extent, but the way Mill yeah. explains it is kind of like our thought process is kind of out of the head now. Like, yeah. we don't even think about it anymore, and we just learned it when we're young, and that's it. Well, no, we would still, we would still think about it. We would still use principles. Um, but we would have the whole emotional side of us supporting that. Right. Um, and, I, you know, I mean, Kant talks, for example, we're going to see this next week, about doing duty, you can do duty um, for the sake of some reward or punishment, or you can do what duty requires because you recognize that that's the right thing to do. I'm not sure if, if and this would, this would bear some, some you know, looking at. I, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on animal oh, behavior. Whether, whether an ape could be said to do and recognize duties for the sake of duty itself. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That, that's, a good, that's a good open question. Um, a lot of big questions coming out today. That's good. Uh, let me shift topics now. So if we have duties, um, things that we should do, that we feel that we should do, that we think other people want to do, that we recognize as good things to do from a utilitarian perspective. Mill brings up a distinction, and this is one that Kant is also going to use, and it's a good distinction to make between what we call perfect and imperfect or strict and meritorious duties. If you say that something is a strict duty, you're saying that somebody really has to do it, or they're doing the wrong thing. That if they violate that, there's, there's something seriously wrong. A meritorious or an imperfect duty is something that, yeah, it's good for them to do. It's better than, than not doing it, but it's not absolutely required. It's not incumbent upon them to do it. Um, okay, he says, perfect or strict duties, uh, 
um, would be things like depriving a person of a possession without having any, any right to do so, or breaking a promise or agreement with somebody, or treating um, a person worse than they deserve, or worse than other people who have no greater claims, playing favorites, being corrupt, um, being unfair, that sort of thing. What are some, some imperfect duties? Um, being kind to other people. This goes again to that Martin Luther King quote, right? The law can tell you that you can't kill other people, that you can't use violence against them, uh, but the law can't make you love them, can it? As a matter of fact, the mere fact that you can't use violence against them might, you know, when you want to, might make you hate them. Um, loving people would be an example of an imperfect duty. If you're with your spouse, and you've, you've made a, a marital commitment, you're um, not supposed to cheat on them, right? I think that everyone agrees that more or less, unless you have one of these things they call an open marriage, you can debate about whether that's actually a marriage or not. Um, in general, I think if you're married to somebody, you're not supposed to be having sex with other people, right? Um, that's a pretty strict duty. It would be good if you love your spouse. It would be good if you don't cheat on your spouse because you love them. But that's not actually required in order to be married, is it? Now, there are plenty of marriages you could think of where we say people are okay people. It would be better if they actually loved their spouse, but uh, unfortunately they, they, they don't. And we don't say, well, the law should you know, do something about this or society should come down hard on them because of that. We might go up to them and say, hey, you know, you're married to a great person. You probably should actually appreciate them. That's saying you have an imperfect duty towards, towards doing this. Um, one way to think about this is corresponding to perfect or strict duties are what we call rights. If I have a right not to be lied to by you, you have a duty not to lie to me. If I have a right, uh, if I pay you for a certain service, for you, you know, to, to that service, then you have a duty to provide me with that service if I paid for it. With meritorious duties, there isn't a corresponding right in all sense. You see the difference? I don't have a right to, to expect that you love me, like me, care about me, talk to me in a nice way, any of that sort of stuff. Do any of you think that, that I have a right to that? Yeah. Not a right, but an expectation. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it. When it comes to meritorious duties in good society, we, um, we have an expectation of that. If you're with people that you know are jerks, you, you don't expect that, right? I mean, that's why we call them jerks. Well, a lot of times people are jerks. They can fulfill all their perfect duties, and then they say, all right, I've done what I have to do. Screw everybody else. And, you know, we say, well, it would be better if you behaved in a different way, if you actually cared about people. It's not just enough just to obey the law or to not, you know, violate people's rights. You should actually be a, a good person in, in other ways. Um, you know, like helping another person when you don't have to. If you have to help them, they have a right for you to help them. Like if you are their caregiver, or you know, even more, if you've contracted to help a person for a certain amount of money, they have a right to expect that from you. Does the old lady, you know, at the at the intersection have a right to expect you to help her cross the street? No. You have a duty, but it's not a perfect or strict duty. It's an imperfect duty. It would be better for you if you did that. It would produce greater happiness overall. But you don't have to do that. As a matter of fact, you could say, good luck, lady. Light's going to change quick. <laughs> better move fast. And you would be a jerk to do so. But you wouldn't be violating any strict duties in doing so. If you tripped her while she was going across, that would certainly violate a strict duty, wouldn't it? To not inflict harm on, on her. Um, and so imperfect duties. We think often that they're not the ones that ought to be enforced by the legal system or by society. There are things that, like Mill says, we wish people should do, we like or admire them for doing.
perhaps dislike or despise them for not doing, but admit they're not bound to do that. So would he disagree with like the Good Samaritan law? Oh, once it's made into a law, now there is a strict duty. But you just said that he believes that the government should only control or make laws about things that are right, not or things that are perfect or strict. Yeah, but so, sometimes, well, there's a sort of a, a quick answer to this and a, and a longer answer. The longer answer involves things like talking about Mill's other works where he thinks that we have like moral progress. We, we get better and better and better over time. So he's, he's willing to say that legal systems come to a better and better understanding of which actually are these. Um, it's, it's a good question, though, because if you think about like the story of the Good Samaritan, it, it's portrayed as this story of a person who, you know, completely gratuitous. They, I mean, a Samaritan at that time and a Jew, they did not mix. They couldn't eat at the same table. They hated each other. And this guy treats an enemy of his people in a loving manner, um, actually leaves some money and says, uh, take care of this guy. I'm going to come back. If, you know, if this isn't enough, I'll pay you more afterwards. Some guy he doesn't know from Adam. Um, the Good Samaritan laws, you guys are all familiar with what those are. Those are the laws in some states that require if you see a car accident, you have to stop and see if the uh, person needs medical assistance. Um, I think in some cases you may, have to, you may actually be required to provide them medical assistance. Is that yeah, I mean, I wouldn't feel very confident myself about providing medical assistance. Um, I mean, what, what of a law like that if we truly were a utilitarianistic society, would yeah. we have even created such a law? Because well, the question, question not the existence that it already exists. Yeah. Well, we have placed it even though we don't expect it of people. That's a good question. Maybe, yeah, maybe that would be the case. Um, I know Mill was more focused on changing things in his own society and his, his own time. Uh, and they were less far along what we might call the path to progress than, than we are today. No, let me let me sort of table those those. Let me just note those as good questions and then kind of kind of table them because right. I, I want to get through um, the rest of this. So one way to think about perfect and imperfect duties is in terms of rights. Another way to think about it is in terms of the greatest happiness principle. These are the ones that if they're not respected, if they're not enforced, this is the reason why Mel thinks we feel that they ought to be enforced. Uh, it, it produces greater collateral damage throughout the society. Um, it says they're of more vital and direct concern to society than imperfect duties because they're, as he says, more vital to human well-being. Um, these the legal system can, can impose. He talks about imperfect duties as being the province of education and opinion. So, you know, we can teach kids things like you ought to be nice to each other. But we don't require it by law. Um, you ought to be beneficent as he says. Um, let's focus now on these, these strict duties. Another way to think about this, so one way to think about these is if they're not enforced and um, followed bad effects overall for society. So think about if we were to, if we were to have a society in which in order to get justice you have to bribe officials, which is the case in some places. I mean, there are some countries where actually just to do business you, you have to factor in the cost of bribes as a cost of doing business. Um, now, why is, that, why is that a problem from a, a justice or a rights perspective? Well, if, if I have to do that, first of all, it's violating my right to be treated fairly according to the system. But think about this. If I can bribe a judge or an official in my case, and you're somehow involved in that case, maybe as a competitor, uh, I've not only just, you know, 
done things for me, I've screwed you over. So if we deserve to be treated fairly, if, say, a legal case deserves to be heard on its merits, not just who happens to have paid the judge more, and I happen to be rich and you happen to be poor, you're not going to have your rights respected. You have a right to equal treatment, you know what I'd say. Um, equal treatment for equal cases. What if that were to become a pattern in society, as it is in some societies? Would that lead to overall bad effects? Do you think? Yeah. People would trust each other less. Um, whenever things were decided, there would be this feeling that it wasn't really decided. It was more based on who, who had the money. Um, if if um, we let people decide in the jury system, our jury system is far from perfect. If we let people decide in the jury system just on the basis of, of who they like and who they don't like, or on the basis of, say, uh, race, or religion, or gender, or something like that, do you think that would have bad effects if we made that into a, a general practice? How would people look at the jury system? Would they be happier with it or less happy with it? Probably less, less happy, right? So, if, if rights aren't respected, then that leads to a worse outcome overall. This takes care, by the way, of the things like the game show thing. If we were to have a society in which we could just sort of like, let's say we pluck people off the street. So, today it's you, and um, we're, you know, this is part of our society now, like in certain movies, you know. So, you're going to be put into this game show situation where you, you have to fight to the death with, with other people for our amusement. You know. Isn't that a movie? There's a whole bunch of movies. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, like one that's coming out. Is it with right Hunger Games? Yeah. It's literally like this. Uh, you know, death, the, the Death Race movies, all, all, all sorts of movies. The Running Man was like that, except it was criminals in that case. Yes, um, kids. Yeah, so, so we do that, right? And now you're a contestant, we watch. We all enjoy this. We're into this show. We get a lot of pleasure out of that. Um, we're happy it's not us, too, by the way. So we even get more pleasure out of it. Um, you're going to experience a lot of pain. So we find ways that you, know, you can kill each other in gruesome, horrible ways. Um, well, that's definitely violating a whole bunch of rights, isn't it? I mean, she has a right not to be plucked up off the street and thrown into some situation, I think. We call that kidnapping. Um, or wrongful abduction. She has a right not to be forced to fight to the death with other people. Not to be treated as, as you know, less than human in some respects. Right? Um, what kind of society would that lead to overall? Now, you know, remember, from an act utilitarian perspective, we'd say, yeah, that's okay. Greater pleasure, less pain. Um, what kind of society would that produce? If, if the thought of that bothers you. Does the thought of that bother any of you? Um, if that bothers you, that pain of that bother should be taken into account. That would actually lower the amount of pleasure. I think if we, it's one thing too to imagine this, and it's another thing to see something like this in place. If you were in a society like that, I'm willing to bet that most, if not all of you, would feel a, set, a sense of moral repugnance towards this. Like, this makes us worse as people. There's something wrong with our society that we, we do this. If that's the case, then it would lead to less, even though in the individual cases it's more, more pleasure than pain because it comes at the expense of one person, it would lead to more pain overall and less pleasure overall. Yeah. I was just going to say, the, the Romans held themselves up as pretty ethical people, I guess, but well, yet they had the yeah. fights like in the Colosseum and they would put yeah. people there against their own free will. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like unfortunately a trend in our societies that we act in such a manner even though I don't know that the Romans actually thought of themselves as a whole as being morally superior to the barbarians. As a matter of fact, some of the Romans admired some of the barbarians, you know, uh, which meant everyone was not Roman, uh, more than them. And Roman society began collapsing from within. But you know, it didn't didn't fall apart just because the, the Germans came in and took over everything, um, it fell apart from the inside because of a lot of um, social problems. Well, let's, let's move on. So, 
Another way of thinking about this that I think Mill doesn't talk about here, but you could frame in a Millsian context. Uh, being deprived of these involves pains that are qualitatively worse. That are much more degrading, that destabilize things more, that humiliate more. <coughs> This is why, for example, I mean, Mill can, you know, we have this thing with quantitative and qualitative pleasures, the qualitative pleasures to be preferred over, the qualitative and higher pleasures to be preferred over any amount of the qualitative and lower pleasure. It works the same way with pains. There's some pains that are, that are worse that um, somebody who's experienced both of these would say, I will put up with any amount of this lesser amount of pain, like a whole bunch of two things, provided I don't have to go through this again. Um, there's some things that are so degrading, so so painful, that I think some people would, would do that. Um, perhaps one way to think about this is when you violate somebody's rights in this sense, you're, you're giving them a qualitatively worse pain. So I'm just going to suggest that. Um, Mill says these ought to be enforced. Um, what does it ultimately go back to? This leads to better consequences for the society. This is what rule utilitarianism is about. Um, so the, the utilitarian in general is not going to violate rights or justice just in terms of expediency. He does leave an escape hatch. I mean, there could be cases where the payoff for um, honoring a certain right might be so bad that you could overturn it in that case. He, he talks about, he says, particular cases may occur in which some other social duty is so important as to overrule any one of the general maxims of justice. Thus, to save a life, it may not only be allowable, but a duty. So not only permissible, but, but a duty to steal or to take by force the necessary food or medicine. You know, if, if, you're, in, if you're in a really bad, unjust situation, that may be what, what's required. To, or to kidnap and compel to officiate the only qualified medical practitioner. But he says, in such cases, what is just in ordinary cases is by reason of the other principle, not just in the particular case. <clears throat> Every case like this is going to involve some other rights being, being upheld. So it's not a matter of just, well, you, know, you can, every once in a while you can, you can violate you know, these, these rules. You would have to have a, a good reason, and there would have to be sort of like weighing off rights against each other. Let's think of a couple of examples. Um, one of the ones that I was thinking about has to do with you know, marriage and, and divorce and child rearing and stuff like that. And I'm going to tell you about a, a particularly horrific case that, that I, I heard about recently. It's from my home state. Um, and I think it's kind of apt here. Uh, and I'm not going to go into any, any of the details about it. You can find the details out on your own. Um, but they're, they're pretty sick. Um, there was a girl who was um, for years held um, in her house's basement. And she, I believe if I remember right, she had a father. Father remarried, so there was a stepmother. And she had a brother. So four people in the family. When they brought her out, she weighed almost 70 pounds. She's, I think, around 14 now. Um, she was starved. Um, she was made to stay in the basement. Um, no toilet facilities. Um, had to wash in, in cold water in a sink every day. Um, was beaten. Uh, was raped. Um, was brought out of the was brought out of the basement sometimes just to be put in the yard to say move cinder blocks around or other totally nonsensical tasks. Um, her mother, her stepmother and father weigh you know like over two hundred pounds each, and she would hear them preparing meals upstairs, um, and you know like for her brother and for them and watching TV, and she'd be confined to the. Basement. This this happened, you know, since she was a little kid. Um, 
they, they treated her this way. And her, her stepmother would tell her she didn't have time to, to feed her. So she starved. And she probably would have died. And it took a long time for the social service agencies to actually get involved. And, and they finally did, thank God. Uh, now imagine just how horrific her life was. Um, <clears throat> those people who were doing it, they, they got a lot of pleasure out of it. They were sadists. You know. So the pleasure that, that they were getting was, we would say, illegitimate. But still, from a utilitarian perspective, pleasure is pleasure, isn't it? And there's three of them and only one of her. So you might say, well, you know, this from, utili from a certain utilitarian perspective, this might actually make sense. But if you feel a sort of repugnance towards that, do you? When you hear about these, these cases, does it make you feel kind of sick? I, I, I imagine so. Um, I read about these things, these sort of things. I'm, I'm not a marshmallow. It makes me want to cry because, it, because you read these, these details. The violation of rights, the sort of degradation that's taking place is so bad. I mean, Mill would call it abominable. That you could pretty much, I mean, this probably would justify vigilantism, going in and taking somebody uh, in those sort of, sort of situations. Um, that's an example of how things can go you know, drastically wrong. Now think of much more trivial examples. Get away from these, these limit, extreme cases. Um, should society be able to regulate how families are structured, what goes on in families? I mean, in cases like that, yeah, I mean, not, not giving your, your kid food uh, or medical attention or you know basic sanitation and things like that, that's definitely a violation of of rights within, within the family. And the state has a the state ought to intervene. Not just the state has a right to intervene, but the state ought to intervene in cases like that. What about other things? You know? It gets a lot trickier then. Think about food. Um, there was a famous there was a case that's becoming kind of famous now, uh, down in North Carolina where uh, a girl um, whose mother, mother sent a pretty good lunch, not considered balanced, I guess from one, you know, with the perspective of the school, um, it would have been a great school lunch in, in my day, and probably in your day too. And I think there was a banana and an apple and a turkey sandwich or something like that. Um, the school said, because they're doing inspections, that's not a balanced lunch, and they made her buy food in the cafeteria. Yeah. Um, now, what is going on there? Somebody's actually asserting this is the right thing to do. This is a policy that we ought to have. You know, from a utilitarian perspective, should we dictate that that Parents have to provide a um, certain level of nutrition to the children? Yeah. What was it missing? I don't remember exactly. I mean, the, the I, I know the full story, but I won't say it because it will ruin the purpose of this. So okay. After we discuss it, I'll tell you like, yeah. what they actually serve for the child. So. Yeah, I mean, they, they have like a list of you have to have so many servings of this, so many servings right. of this. And there was something that was missing. Yeah. Um, in any case, the broader, the broader thing should should um, should the state or society or some larger entity be you know making sure that parents provide certain kinds of food to their children and maybe not other kinds. Maybe children shouldn't have lots of soda or shouldn't be eating fast food or things like that. Again, you can think about that from a utilitarian perspective. Are there rights involved? What kind of society? It could be that, that that would be a good thing overall. I mean, if, if somebody tell if somebody's telling you you can't feed your kid crap, you can't feed them, you know, empty calories. That sounds like a good thing. Could it lead to worse effects overall if the state is coming in that heavy-handedly? What do you think? This is an open question where a utilitarian would have to debate this on its merits. What are you going to say? I feel like. If the the state can set certain standard. I I just think it, chips. I just think it's utterly appalling for somebody to walk around and, and do that. And that lunch right there, that sounds like a good healthy lunch to me. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting case. There's a much broader set of food issues involved with it. Let me shift the topic now for another example too. There's other things about marriage. 
Um, what do we think is involved when people actually get married? Are there are there rights towards each other that come with that? What, are, what would you say they are? Strict rights where, where you know these ought to be enforced in some way. Well, I think the both of them have to take care of it. Like, if I'm a husband, I'm supposed to take care of my wife. Just make sure that okay. you know we have a house, pay for the rent. Not only me, but both, both of us have have to provide each other basic necessities. Yeah, I think I, I think you can make an argument for that. Um, in the past, we now have no fault divorce in most most states where you don't have to actually have any reason for divorcing somebody. But in the past, if you wanted to get divorced, you had to have some sort of reason, and that could that could possibly be a good reason to say, "Hey, there's no money. They're they're working, but they spend it all on on gambling or liquor or something like that. You know, we need to we need to split up." Because they're not taking care of, they're not providing basic necessities. But did you ever know? <coughs> Does this how you pay each other the rates? <coughs> to speak their own mind in the relationship? Yeah, to, to not be punished for expressing themselves. Um, okay. Is that a le do you think that's a right that ought to be legally enforced? <coughs> you know, like domestic violence, but. Yeah. I mean, it's not at that point yet, so we do not. Yeah, maybe, well, if you bring up domestic violence, that's a good good example. We can say there's definitely a right not to have force used against the other person. Sometimes we talk in terms of emotional abuse. Maybe you could say that there ought to be some sort of, if not at this point, legal, but moral right against emotional abuse. Um, somebody, had, did you ever hear that? Yeah, I was going to say, I think that emotional abuse is definitely a factor. Like, just because you're not dating someone doesn't mean you're not like yelling at them and screaming at them all the time and not letting them on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think think that, I, I think that could be important. Yeah, I think from a utilitarian perspective, <coughs> um, emotional abuse might actually in some ways <coughs> be worse than um, some forms of physical abuse at least. Incidentally, I, I think that you could make a case with this qualitatively worse thing from a Millsian perspective that, that rape is in some sense a worse uh, crime than murder. Uh, if you look at it in terms of pains, pleasures, and, and the qualities of the pains and pleasures. Um, okay, so a lot of these are sort of like don't do this, don't do that rules, you know, or, or have to do this kind of rule. Are there other things in a marriage that ought to be the case but we probably wouldn't want to say, well, if you do this, you're legally liable. Um, some of these have changed over time. I mean, in the past, if you committed adultery, if you, if you were married and you, you know, screwed around with somebody else, you could get in a lot of trouble. You can still do so in the military. There's, there's a law against the military code of justice. Um, you can be punished for it. Um, a lot of states have gotten rid of those. You might say there's a moral right, though. What do you guys think? If you're married to somebody, do you have a do you have a right to fidelity on their part? Why get married otherwise? Why not just shack up? <laughs> um, maybe it's not a, a legal right anymore, but I think you'd probably still consider it a moral right. Um, do you have a right to expect that your spouse is going to behave in a loving manner towards you? Would that be <clears throat> a right in this sense, like a, a, a strict duty, or do you think that might be a meritorious duty? What do you think? Do you think, I mean, let's put aside the state, because the state's not going to come in and like, watch everybody. Do you think society, like your neighbors, your family, all of them should like, you know, make sure that you, you love your husband or your wife? Yeah. I think just because you just said the state's not going to do it, it makes it very serious. Well, it could be society in general. Too. Yeah. If, if we feel that some sort of compulsion ought to be brought to bear on the person. Um, we, there are some people who, I mean, not that often, but some people marry for the sake of staying in the country. Or That's true. Yeah, all sorts of instrumental reasons. Yeah, yeah. instrumental reasons that don't have the same type of like pressures. They like this person's house, car, yeah. bank account. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you another one that I, I brought up in, in the other class. Um, 
this seems like an interesting one to think about. Let's say it's not even just a matter of marriage, spouses, but just any sort of committed relationship that you're in. Do you have a duty to reveal to your spouse previous relationships that you've had if you're still in some way involved with those, those people? You're still working with them, you're still going to school with them, they're still they're living next door to you. They're in, your, they're in your spouse's book club. Uh, yeah, what do you think? Like, the book club one, I don't know. Like, they're interacting with them all the time. But as long as you're not doing anything, like, shady, I don't think it's, like, needed to tell them. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's imperfect because it doesn't pertain directly to you and her. So it would be more of an expectation for her than the way that she knows. I think, yeah, if it is a duty, it would certainly be an imperfect duty. I think the consequences of your significant other finding that out and to the extent that they'd be pissed off, probably you should just come out and say it anyways. And so if you're a good utilitarian. Well, the idea is it's going to be so much worse if they find out. Yeah. Well, didn't you say that when people like violate other people's rights, then it becomes the duty of someone else to check? Like, I feel like military and yes. police people, if duties aren't, don't get completed, then it's their job to try to, you know, it's kind of like a cycle. You're exactly right. And that's, that's what Mill um, is, is talking about in this section in terms of compulsion. Um, he doesn't talk in terms of, like, military or, or police, or we could also extend this to our corrections officers. He's talking about it in terms of if we think that um, somebody has a strict duty to respect somebody's rights, that they ought to be compelled to respect those rights. And who does that in our society? Police, military, corrections officers, who else? Uh, I suppose in, in a lesser sense, not so much using compulsion, but using persuasion, teachers, um, parents, people belonging to other organizations. But you're, you're exactly right. That, to say that somebody has a right means that if somebody isn't respecting it, somebody else ought to be compelling them to do that. And maybe a police officer has a greater duty to make sure that that happens. So when a police officer becomes corrupt, it's not quite the same thing as, say, a business person engaging in a corrupt deal. Maybe there's a greater violation there. It produces greater unhappiness in society. Let's look at a few uh, examples that we could think about in these terms. Um, abortion is a great example in part because how do both sides of the, the, the abortion debate that's been going on for now you know, close to 30 years, well, longer than that actually, longer than Roe versus Wade, um, how do they often frame it? They frame it in terms of rights, don't they? Um, there's two ways in which, in which the debates usually get um, arranged Leave religion outside of it for, for a moment, because the religious stuff often ends up appealing to rights or ends up appealing to um, utilitarian arguments. Um, what are the rights that are usually thrown out there on the table? Yeah? Um, the rights of the mom and the rights of the baby. Mm -hmm. You could look at more, too. I mean, um, if you were looking at this from a strictly, strictly utilitarian perspective, you'd also want to take into account father, if he knows about it or cares, maybe the grandparents. Um, as a societal issue, you could probably look at the whole society. Um, some societies that, that have, you know, uh, legalized abortion because of other things that are going on in their society and have now ended up with massive gender imbalances, right? China and India. India actually had to pass a law uh, outlawing ultrasounds because too many uh, girl um, uh, fetuses were being aborted in that generation. And I'm starting to look like what's happening with China. Um, but you're right. You, usually it's framed in terms of the mother's rights. And what, do we, what are those rights usually called? What, what are, how are they usually framed? What's that? Pro choice and pro life. Uh, right to choose, or also in terms of reproductive rights, mm -hmm. is the word that's used quite often these days. 
So a right to choice, Roe versus Wade actually figured it not as a right to choose, but a right to privacy, <coughs> believe it or not. That if, you, if you look at the case, that's what it is. And then the, the, the other side, how do they frame it? They're, they focus on, on the right fetus. To right to life, right? So you have what looks like a moral dilemma because you have different rights being, being contested. And if you were going to try to resolve this in individual cases, or if you're going to try to resolve this on a societal you know, basis, you know, should we have laws regulating this? Um, Mill would say you have to look at it in terms of rights. You have to actually determine who has rights. One of the problems with the abortion debate is there's no general agreement on precisely who has what rights. That's one reason why it's so intractable. Once you actually decide that there is a right to life on the part of the fetus, you're pretty much going to be on, on one side, aren't you? If you focus exclusively on a woman's right to choose, or a right to privacy, or reproductive rights, those sorts of things, and you don't look at this, you're going to be on this side, aren't you? If you actually put all of them on the table, it gets a little bit trickier, doesn't it? And that, that's where we get to situations like, well, you know, what if she's raped? What if um, uh, the child is, is uh, going to have a um, less than ideal life because of genetic defects? Um, what if she's raising the child in poverty? Uh, and people lay out these sorts of things. Could this be looked at from a utilitarian perspective? in terms of overall happiness and unhappiness? Probably. I mean, there's actually a third option between sort of open season abortion and no abortion whatsoever um, that our society is not really promoting. More adoptions, right? Carrying children to term and then finding them homes. Um, from a utilitarian perspective, that might actually be the, the best thing to pick, one which could respect the majority of the rights in question um, and lead to be better outcomes. Um, let's take another example, one, one that's uh, perhaps a little bit more straightforward. Um, think about our judicial system. We have this principle that it's um, you're innocent until proven guilty, right? Ideally. I mean, there's, that's not to say that the cop who's interrogating you is going to believe that, but in general, you're presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. And they say that it's better that, that 10 guilty men should go free than that, that one innocent should be sent to, to prison or punished. Um, what do you guys think about that? Do you think that it is better? That 10 guilty people, 10 people who've actually committed crimes, who've violated other people's rights, go free, then that one innocent person should be convicted. Not every legal system does it that way. Europeans don't do it that way. Every place that has code Napoleonic, there is no presumption that you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. Um, it doesn't work that way in, in every, every single place. Doesn't even work that way everywhere in the United States, does it? Um, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I heard a man talk about he was proven guilty, but he, I heard he wasn't guilty, but he was in jail for like 20 years. Yeah. And he came to my high school to speak, and I think they lose so many rights by being in prison when they're not supposed to be, that it's a violation of, if you're not, if you're innocent and you're, they think you're guilty, you're losing right. a lot. Yeah, if we look at the individual case, somebody who's innocent, who's convicted, which does happen, then their, their rights have been violated. And, and well, sometimes they're actually able to bring um, suits you know, against the states that, that convicted them. Um, well, let's say we look at the broader thing. Is it, is it better that 10 guilty people free than that one innocent person go to prison. You're utilitarian. Well, you might actually still say yes if you're a really utilitarian. If 
you're an act utilitarian, absolutely no way. Ten guilty people still out there doing bad things versus one innocent person. Um, but if you're a rule utilitarian, maybe it's more important to respect that one person's rights so that the system keeps working. Otherwise, people will have less faith in the system, and they'll say people are being railroaded, you know, um, they're not going to cooperate with the police, they're not going to cooperate with the, the DAs, they're not going to cooperate with the attorneys. Society will lose some legitimacy. Maybe there's, <clears throat> maybe, maybe there's a good case from a utilitarian perspective for better to let 10 guilty men free than convict one.